Matthew chapter 14, from verse 34 to verse 36. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when, and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all that surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were cured. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this morning. We thank you for what you've already shared. Lord, I just pray for all of us, Lord God, um, maybe our hearts have already been so full. I just ask, Lord, that your word will penetrate this morning, Lord God, everyone who is here, Lord Jesus, help them to, Lord, focus now, Lord God, help them to hear, Lord God, I ask that you'll anoint our ears, Lord God, help us to hear what you have to say, O oh Lord, I ask, Father God, for strength this morning, I ask, Lord God, for the liberty and freedom from the Holy, Sp for the, uh, Holy Spirit to speak your word, Lord God, in a manner that is easy to understand, Lord God, for everyone here. And Holy Spirit, Lord, I just ask that you will move in this place, that people will know, Lord, that what I have to say does not come from a man, but comes from you, Lord. I pray that your word will be heavy this morning, that people will know, Lord God, that this is your word. This is not the word of a man. This is not a word that will pass and away, but your word will remain forever, Lord God. Heavens and earth will pass away but your word will remain forever. I pray for that, Lord, clarity and sober-mindedness to be in this place, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Praise the Lord. Okay. I do recognize we... We've heard a lot already this morning, and um, the word I have this this morning, uh, I I will keep uh, short as 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 the Holy Spirit allow, allows me. Um, I've got a real s simple message, and I'm gonna get right into the message. So, um, f this last couple of weeks has been um, very very difficult. Uh, just a lot of things that's happened at points. I don't want to want to make that co comparison. I did tell my parents this morning, I had like the the the, the Job weeks, um, but obviously not nearly as as bad as Job did. But just it felt one thing after the other, and um, it made me really think of certain passages in the Bible and and reflect on them. And I was actually thinking a lot about the storm in the Gospels that Jesus. Um, quiets the storm in the Gospels. Um, and I was thinking a lot about this passage. Um, and then I, I had, as I was reading the Word of God, I, I came to this passage, as you can see in Matthew 14 there in the text, this passage, this little passage of Scripture occurs right after Jesus um, quiets the storm um, and so when I got to this passage, the Holy Spirit really spoke to me. And so what I'm about to share with you is what the Lord shared for me in my situation. And um, I do think it's very relevant. Um, and I know this is a strange text to preach from. This is one of those texts that we would quickly pass over. It's like a, a transition text almost from you know, to get to the, the next piece of narrative, really, in the Gospels, we look at this little summary in Gennesaret, and we move on. The title of my message is The Message in Gennesaret. The Message in Gennesaret. What, what is these three verses? Why is it there? Um, of course, you know, you'll have your smart scholars who will talk about the, the necessary component of summarizing certain narrative events and, and you know, progressing the narrative um, at points. But, you know, I, I always look to look at the Gospels as divine. The, 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 the Bible is, is, is unique in how it's written. And I think we all have experienced that, that you know, sometimes the, the most, you know, just obscure passages of Scripture 
they have such meaning sometimes when the Lord opens them and speaks to them, speaks uh, using them into your situation. It's amazing. There's no other book on, on earth that does that that you can go through even sometimes reading a bunch of names and the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And you think, well, this was just supposed to, you know, list the names and follow the tribes, but yet th there's power in the Word of God. And many times we forget that. We forget how amazing the Word of God is and how, you know, it can just speak a word that is so in season and it's something that we, we, we miss. And we, of course, you know, I, I've pointed out many times how you can have these little uh, stories within stories in, in the Gospels. You know, of course, the big Gospel is the good news of Jesus and, and what we know about the coming kingdom, the coming Messiah and his story of victory and of bringing the kingdom of God. This, this, is, this is the story of the Gospels. But then in, in this story that is told throughout all four of the Gospels, there are little, little narratives that just is so powerful and has spoken to people for thousands of years now. It's just amazing. It just doesn't seem that we can ever exhaust the just the, the, the wonder of God's Word, isn't it? It's just amazing, absolutely amazing. And here I think we are stumbling on something very beautiful again. And this is what God spoke to me. And it's, it's a word I needed because, you know, a bit like Peter at one point, I, I felt like the, the waves was, was, was overwhelming, very much overwhelming. Now here... In Gennesaret, now we have, we have Matthew's account of three verses here, but Mark also gives us this account. Now, Mark, in Mark 6, if you want to turn there and you just have your eyes on it, you should even have a heading there that shows you Mark 6, verse 53 to 56. Mark ha has even a little bit of a bigger account of what happens here in Gennesaret. Um, says basically the same thing. Um, but it's interesting, right, because Mark is supposed to be the shorter, quicker version of Matthew, but Mark does not exclude this as well. Mark actually still includes this and even gives us a bigger summary of what happens here. And so we want to we wanna look today, and it's like I said, it's a, be a, a, a short message and a very simple message, but a message we need in this hour, a, a message I desperately needed. So let's get right into the word here this morning. We know that the disciples in Jesus, they just had this encounter on the Sea of Galilee with the storm, and Peter walking on the water and all of that. And they now get to the side where this town is, Gennesaret. And it just says when they get there and they get out, it says that some people there recognize Jesus. And when I was reading that, for some reason, this just struck my heart like it's, it's never done before. I don't know why this, 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 for this time the Lord was really pressing this on my heart, that there were these people who recognized Jesus. And what I want to just say to you, the, 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 the message of Gennesaret, how important it is to recognize Jesus. How important it is to recognize Jesus. You see, recognizing Jesus is different from seeing Jesus. Right? We can see, we, you know, people can see Jesus, but they don't recognize Jesus. Now, what is interesting, how this chapter concludes... Of course, we know that, you know, chapter divisions came way later than the inspired text. But, you know, it helps to see that there's a, there's a theme building here, right? If you look at the beginning of the chapter, Herod does not recognize who Jesus is. He, facts, he thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist resurrected. Then in the next part of the, par uh, uh, the narrative in, in Matthew 14, you have Jesus 
feeding the 5,000. And again, the disciples have a problem recognizing who Jesus is in that situation. And then it gets, of course, to the Sea of, uh, uh, of Galilee with the storm. And if you remember the narrative, the, 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 the disciples, they first struggle to recognize who Jesus is. Some think he's a ghost. They don't recognize him in this situation. And it ends with them arriving at this town with some people who recognize Jesus. Who sees Jesus. And there is a time, we, you know, where I think in our lives, and it's, it's so important that you know, we had actually a lot this morning. I don't know if you remember as we... We're singing and during the worship and praying, how many people prayed, Lord, open our eyes. So many of our songs were about opening our eyes and help us to see, give us grace to see. Uh, there is a lot of that this morning. And I, I do believe that, you know, if you look at what happened to Israel, and, and this, is, this is the danger that we're dealing with here, is as Isaiah prophesied that, God's people will come to a point where they will see but no longer perceive. They will hear but they will not understand because their hearts have grown dull. They, they see but they do not see. They, they, they do not recognize. And of course, as Jesus was going through the cities, many people did not really recognize who, who he was and, and, and who, who he is. And I, and I feel like, the, you know, the, the, the story of the Gospels is so prophetic, church, because you see what we have in the Gospels is the Messiah, and he's walking through these cities, he's walking through these towns, and some see who he is, and they respond to that, and some, you know, they, they, they're there, they're around him, they even see signs and miracles, but they do not, they do not follow him, they do not draw near to him. You have these texts where you see people have these little windows, these, these, these periods of time to respond. Jesus is in that city. He's there. He's preaching. He's, 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 he's healing. He's, he's, he's forgiving. All of that. And they've got these glimpses. They've got a window to act, to respond. And for us, it's, it's not very different, church. It's that we don't know how long our window is of time. We don't know how long we have, but we have a window. And in that window, it is crucial that you recognize who is Jesus. Amen. Who is he? And many times we, we go even through church and we forget who Jesus is. We get blinded by, you know, for some of us, it's blinded by sin, okay, and its desires and all of that. For others, it's just trouble, right? It's just trouble. It's just stormy waters. Others, it's, it's opposition. It's, you know, it's problems. But the reality is, is that in those moments, it's so important to not lose sight of the Messiah, not to lose sight of who Jesus is. You see, what I love about this text is that, you know, you see that they, they you know, the, Jesus arrives at the shore. And I don't know, these people were going on with their lives, right? And, you know, who knows, some of them were, you know, going to work in the field. Some of them, you know, had other things to tend to or fishing. I, I don't know exactly. But they had obviously things to do. They had their lives to run. But Jesus showed up and everything stopped for them. Because they recognized Jesus. Everything stopped. Jesus is here. Now everything gets second place. Jesus is first. These are people who see Jesus rightly. Who recognize who he is. This is, this is, this is the Messiah. This is, this is the Lord. This is the King of Kings. This is the one who heals. This is the one who has power over demons. This is the one. This is the one we need to bring our problems to. They recognize who he is. You know, and at least for me, like I said, you know, you can, I, I, I just, with all the stuff that happened, 
And this is so important. This, this recognition I'm talking about, it's, it's more than knowing who Jesus is. You know, all of you can tell me Jesus is God. All of you can tell me that Jesus is Lord. All of you can tell me that Jesus has all power and authority. But to recognize that in the moment, that's the key. That's the key. What I love about the Gospel of Matthew, I think, I think he does it the best here, is as opposition is increasing against Jesus, so you see the authority of a Jesus more and more manifesting. Who is this Jesus? You know, and I just feel many of us, and I think this is what the Lord has asked me to do this morning. I just want to point you back to your shepherd this morning. And I want to remind you of who he is. Jesus, the one who defeated death, the one who is currently seated at the right hand of God, the one who has all authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Everything has been given to him. This is your shepherd. The one who has all power over demons, all power over Satan himself, all power over sickness and diseases, all, 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 all kinds of problems, all kinds of tribulation, everything. All things are underneath his feet. And church, we need to recognize who Jesus is in this moment. And I think the Lord wants us to grow in this area because recognizing Jesus, seeing Jesus for who he really is in the moment will bring the right response. The right response. And that's just what you see here. You know, I, 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 you know for many of us, when, when, when calamity hits or wh whatever our situation or circumstances you know, it is, it is in those instances, especially here in the Gospels, where it's so important to recognize Jesus. And I want to say this even more for us as a church. You know, we have an awesome shepherd, an awesome shepherd, a faithful shepherd, a good shepherd, a shepherd who loves us, who gave his life for us. And it's important that we cling to Him. Cling to Him. I know that, you know, many of us can go through many different trials and all of that. But in this instance, you know, what I see in this text and what is, you know, what just blessed me so much and as the Lord was reminding me is, my son, I have not changed. I am the same. You have You've got blindness here. Do you recognize who I am? Because those who do, everything else gets put back in their place and they run to me. They run to me. I know many of you may be here this morning and you need to hear this word. You need to hear that the Lord is your shepherd. And he has not changed. And it doesn't matter what you're going through now. He wants you to recognize that he has all authority and all power. And that he loves you so, so much. But you need to come to him. He's the answer. He's the answer. There is no one greater than him. No one. And this is what's so different from all other religions and all, you know, Man will always try and, and, and squeeze, you know, himself into that place. But in the true church of Jesus, in the true church of Jesus, Jesus has his rightful seat. Jesus is the beginning and the end. He is everything you need. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And you need to recognize that. All the world, even though we see so much of fear and doubt and the world is is confused about many things and there's now wars and rumors of wars and there's a, a new pandemic every week and people are afraid and the economy is just going to crumble and this and that. 
Jesus is the King of kings and His kingdom will never pass away. Never pass away. Do you know that? Do you recognize who He is? Do you know He holds all things in His hands? Church, please, it's time to recognize Jesus. You know, sometimes God is just small in our eyes. He's small in our hearts. And it's sometimes just to go back and, and, and just to look and recognize, wow. You know, I, I've spoken many times, you know, I haven't been much in church the last couple of weeks, but before that about hope. Hope is the, the eyes, uh, the, the vision, that the, the faith. The, faith is the eyes of a Christian. The, the, the bigger his eyes is, the bigger his faith has the potential of seeing. And what does faith see? Faith always sees the, the ingredients of hope, the future. The, 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 and hope is an assurance in Scripture. It's a sure thing. Because these are not built on man's promises. These are things that God said will be. It will be. This is a hope that is, is steadfast. It should be an anchor for us. It's rooted in the unseen, the eternal things that does not change. The temporal things will change. Oh, we have to get ready for a lot more turbulence on this ride to eternity. We have to get ready for a lot more turbulence to the eternal city. There's going to be a lot more shaking. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. There will be a lot more fear. There will be a lot more doubt. There will be a lot more attempts by the devil to challenge your faith, to, to, to destroy your faith in Jesus. The devil will continue to try to bring all kinds of things into the church. The devil will continue to, to try and throw the church off. All of that is still going to happen and more. The, uh, the devil will open his mouth. There will be a flood of evil. All of this is coming. But Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. And he has all authority. And he says, you're in my hand. And no one, no one plucks you. Out of my hand. Hallelujah. Can I get a hallelujah this morning? This is your Lord. This is your King who fights for you. Jesus, you know, think about this. Jesus, every day, I know we, we know these verses, but we, sometimes we just need to stop and meditate on these truths because they are they're taken for granted. Jesus, every single day, interceding for you and me. Praying for us. Interceding for us. Isn't that amazing? He has all authority. He has all power. But you see, I think what we are lacking is the, not just the recognition, right? I think if we start recognizing Jesus rightly for who He really is, how valuable he is. <clears throat> you know, I was just, when Brother Ben was singing, Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. Is that your faith this morning? Is it as fresh as that? Do you recognize who this is? There is no one more valuable than this. You see, we get we get, we, we get, our faith gets old. Keith Green sang a song about that too. My faith is old and my eyes are dry. This faith that gets old is equivalent to eyes that starts to lose its vision. And you're no longer able to recognize Jesus. You know things, of course, 
But as many of us can testify, that doesn't help. It's to recognize Him. To know in every situation who He is. That's in many ways when we at the camp we spoke about the names of God. It was in these situations that God revealed Himself in a special way to His people. They knew God. Not just a name on the board. They knew God this way. They knew Him this way as a shepherd, as peace, as a healer. They knew Him like that. And it's so important because I feel that at least in my own heart, and this is, this is sort of the message I'm speaking to you this morning, is what God said to me. So all these things is me first, of course, this morning. But I, I, I just, I need a fresh, fresh faith. And I need to recognize who He is. And when, when that happens, you know, it's amazing how that a lot of things just renew in a, in a believer, you know, because when you recognize who he is and you recognize what he can do, it addresses so many things that, you know, fear and anxiety and doubt, but not just that, if you recognize who he is, you recognize his value, suddenly without, without trying, you, you, you recognize how urgent the need is to share him, to to, to bring people to Him. That's what they see here. They, 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 they recognize who He is. And what is their response? Get the people to Him. Get Him. Get the people. This is Him. He's the Savior. He's the healer. He's the one who can break strongholds. Oh, we all know He does these things. But it's not fresh. It's not this recognition in that moment where it's alive. And this is, this is what real faith always looks like. It's always action. It's always action. It's always responding. And it leads to my, my second point, and, and, and that's the, the final point here, is that obviously they go and they bring, they go throughout the whole region. And Mark says they go throughout the whole region. And say, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And they bring, in, and, and this is what is included here. This is a very important piece of information. It says, they ask that they can touch the fringe of his garment. That, that's what they ask. That's what they ask. And it says, as many as touched his fringe of the garment were healed. Now, Jesus healed many other ways. Why is this so significant? Now, of course, earlier in Matthew, Matthew 9, we know of a woman who touched the fringe of his garment, the woman who had problems with bleeding, and she was healed. But I think what many overlook is the significance of how the Jewish people understood this action, what it actually really means. Um, there's actually, you know, there's some crazy stuff out there in, 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 in scholarship, but, you know, some scholars who even say that Jesus was accommodating here for superstition. They were superstitious and he wanted to accommodate. It's just some crazy stuff that people get, believe these days. But, what we see here really is going to highlight a principle that is important after we recognize Jesus. After we recognize Him for who He is, you, you see the response that is needed. Now, I want you to, to quickly turn to Malachi chapter 4. And I just want your eyes on verse 2. It's a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And it says that this, the sun of righteousness shall rise and that there shall be healing in his wings. There shall be healing in his wings. Now, Hebrew is, is quite 
sometimes, uh, you know, at least I find it a lot more trickier than, than Greek. It's because this word for Hebrew kanaf, for wings, is also the word for the fringe or the corner of a garment. It's the same word. And what is this referring to if you know your Bible well? In Numbers 15, verses 37 to 41, God commanded Israel at the corner of their garments to make tassels. And these were to remind Israel of the commandments and covenant that God made with, with Israel, right? And so what the woman was grabbing in Matthew 9 was these tassels of, the, of Jesus' his, his, uh, garment. Now, Jesus, by the way, uh, addresses the Pharisees because you see with the Pharisees, with their clothing, they, they made these tassels and these things so, you know, uh, over the top to point out how religious they are, all right? Um, but it was common for all Jewish men to have these tassels at the corner of their uh, uh, garments. But Matthew 4, 2 highlights, and, and this is very important to, to understand, in, for these people to say to the Messiah and for that woman to come and reach out to his tassel is faith that Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah will have healing power at, in the fringe of his garment, in these tassels. That's how they understood it. When she reached out for him, that faith is what made her well. That's what Jesus says. Your faith is what healed you. And these people, rightly or wrongly, looking at this verse and her hearing that she was healed, they were coming to him and said, look, we know that the word of God says there should be, you're the Messiah. If we touch it, there's healing. Amazing. What's the key here? Recognizing Jesus for who he is and then have an absolute dedication to applying the word of God in your life. You know, I, I think many of us, you know, and I, I've sometimes been in that place as well. You see, especially this in young believers, they'll come to the Lord and you know, they'll take some maybe uh, where Jesus is using an analogy. They'll take it literally and they'll want to do it 100%. Uh, one of the examples would be, you know, foot washing or these kinds of things where Jesus is really highlighting the spiritual principle. But you see what Jesus treasures, and I want you to hear this this morning. What Jesus treasures and what where, where the the healing power, where the, the intervening of God's power comes into our lives, where the kingdom of God floods through faith into our lives, is where he sees sincere obedience to his word, a real response to his word. And I was challenged by that because I think, you know, for some of us, you know, we, we like revelation, we like knowing, you know, all mysteries and solving many things, but just simply taking the word of God and with full faith and assurance, applying that in our lives, this is necessary. And you see, it says all those who did this, all those who, who halted this verse and came and, and said, you are the Messiah, you, there, there has, this has to be, there was healing in their lives. They were touched by God. And I think in many of us, this is where the response is not there. Right? We know maybe who Jesus is. We do not recognize him. 
And moreover, we, we, we know the Word of God has, says to us many things that we know, but we are, our, our obedience here, our response here to the Word of God is lacking, is lacking. And I say this again because I think this is really important to hear. These people had a window. They, they, they had an urgency about this. They, they, they knew, okay, he's here now. We don't know for how long he will remain in this city. And they responded with 100%. They went through the region. They got people to Jesus. If they self needed to go to him, they went to him. They had a, a, a verse, they had a word that they wanted to apply. They wanted to put the word and mix it with faith. And there was power. Power. Amen. You know, Leonard Ravenhill in his book, Why Revival Tarries, he has this quote that I think many of the, the, the Leonard Ravenhillites know. Uh, and it's this. He says, A time will come when those who know the word of God will be put to shame by those who do the word of God. That's going to happen. The, the, there's, there's a time like that coming. And you know that the Pharisees, they could have, they knew Malachi 4 too. They could have expounded that. They never touched, tasted the power of that verse. You see, there was power in that verse. And when, they, when, when faith was mixed with that verse, they experienced the power of the Messiah. I want to tell you something. Your, your word that you're holding there, the word of God. Yes, it's a book. It's been printed by paper and all of that. But the words there can unleash the power of God in your life if you choose to mix it with faith. You believe that this morning? Because for us, the word of God is, is what I read. It is what I meditate on, you know, and it's what we come to hear maybe on Sunday. But I just want to emphasize this again because Jesus as well, he says this at the end of his sermon, his big sermon, the conclusion that he gives at the Sermon on the Mount is he says there's two builders, right? One who builds on the rock, one who builds on the sand. And the only difference is it says they both hear the word of God. But the one who builds on the rock is the one who does it as well. The one who builds on sand is the one who hears it and does his own thing. And it's these simple things. The message of Gennesaret. Recognize Jesus for who he is. And recognize the power of God's word. There's two realizations in this passage that I feel as Christians in the West we're missing. We have a blindness, an old faith, because we're all very clever people. We've, you know, knowledge up, science up, you know, logic, all of that. And we've forgotten the plain application of the Word of God, when it, even when it doesn't make sense. God does impossible things. He does things that doesn't make sense. That's what miracles are. They break the natural order. And we're bound by what we know and, and what can and cannot. And we, we need to break free of this. And I tell you, this is why many of these miracles take place in other countries that are so less educated and, you know, they're not as smart as us. Because they simply look at the Word of God and they believe it. And they go and they say, God said it. I will apply it, and God comes through. And we look and we think, why? Why is that? Why is that? Because God rewards faith. Right throughout the Gospels, Jesus only marveled at one thing. Did you know that? He only marveled. When he says he was amazed or marveled, only at one thing. What was that? An unbelievable amount of faith. That God Jesus, an amazing look on his face, says, wow. And you know where he saw this faith? He didn't see it in his own people anymore. He saw it 
in the centurion. And he saw it in the Syrophoenician woman. These are the two people who made Jesus marvel. And they were not children of Abraham in the flesh. They didn't have the tradition. They didn't have the scriptures. We are in the same place. We've become dull of hearing. Our eyes are like Eli in Samuel. It's growing weary. We can barely see. We can't recognize Jesus in our lives anymore. And even though we're full of the word of God, it's very hard for us to mix these things with faith. It's difficult. It's difficult. And this message of Gennesaret, even though this is three verses, we normally just, you know, go on to the next page. I think it is a prophetic word for us. And I just want to invite you to go with me to, to prayer. I want to pray that God will open our eyes. I had this song, you know, I sing it often, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. But I just ask the Lord to, Lord, I, I want to recognize you for who you really are. This is why, you know, we talk about where's the fear of God? Where is, if you, do you remember the when you're in the presence of God and you see Him for who He is, nobody has to tell you, be afraid. And it's, we, nobody has to explain to you that it's not like, you know, a fear that pushes you away from... Nobody has to explain. Because you see. You see clearly. You know. I don't know where we are, but I know the West is in Israel's condition. And we are fighting this to keep it out there in the sense that the spiritual condition, that our own hearts are not becoming like this, that we're not becoming an Israel, seeing and not perceiving, hearing and not understanding, our hearts becoming dull of hearing. We're in danger of this. Even though we can hear many times prophetic messages, they heard Jesus, they heard Paul, they heard many throughout the ages. I, if we've said this before again, and, and of course, anointed preaching can harden you if you don't obey, if you don't listen. It can do the opposite effect because it's light shining. And the more you refuse it, the more insensitive you'll become to the Word of God. It's also a window. It's a season of grace. When God does move in the church in any way, it's an hour to respond. It's an hour to, to open our eyes. So let us stand this morning. If you want to go on your knees or however you want to, but ask the Lord, Lord, just be honest with him this morning. Am I recognizing you for who you really are? Because many of us, you know, we've gone through, we've been Christians for a long time. I understand that. Isra would have said the same thing. We are, we are the children of Abraham. Yeah, but most of them did not see the Messiah anymore. They didn't even know his voice. We can be like that church. We want to recognize Jesus for who He is. And do we recognize the power that is in His Word? Amen. I want to tell you, I want to remind you, the devil, this is one of the biggest things he does. Right from the garden, he questions the Word of God. He hates the Word of God because the Word of God defeats him. And when people lose faith in the Word of God, that is that they no longer apply it in their life. These uh, realities that you see, they've start vanishing. 
Let us ask the Lord to revive these things in us.